Well, as you can see, Miss Cindy sort of stole my son thunder this morning with her temptation hat. Wasn't that a lot of fun? I mean, the, what are the kind of things that, uh, that you wrestle with on a basis? Maybe none of the things that you wrestle with were on that hat, you know? Uh, I think we all wrestle with the sweets thing and the food issues a little bit. Oh, maybe it's fried foods instead of sweets. Mmm, boy, I love fried chicken. Or it might be something, not on that hat, something closer akin to gossip. I mean, you know, we could come up with a nice long list. Uh, it's, it's tax time, almost tax time. Uh, anybody tempted to budge the numbers a little bit? <laughs> uh, I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but one of the things I'm tempted about is political speech. I, I like to talk politics, but in our polarized, divided world, that's hard. And as a pastor, if I say something, I can alienate somebody that thinks differently politically than I do. And so I try to be pretty neutral. I think people can figure out maybe where I am, but I certainly will not stand here in this place <laughs> and talk uh, partisan politics in any way. Uh, but that's something I do wrestle with. You know what? <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons we thought I had fun with the, with the hat this morning and, and this sort of list of things, we could all come up with a list of stuff, is we treat temptations a little bit like a game of cat and mouse, don't we? We sort of treat it like a game sometimes. We try to sneak something past God. <laughs> I, a great illustration is this week, you know, Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. But what's the day before Ash Wednesday? Fat Tuesday! Right, right, right. That's when you can just do anything and everything you want because God's going to take all the fun out of life on Wednesday. <laughs> and that, it, it sort of makes this whole thing a, a game. <clears throat> what is temptation all about anyway? What's really, what is it really about? I mean, yeah, there's a simple thing. Oh, gosh, I'm tempted by that candy bar, that kind of little light something. Something else is I'm tempted to take revenge, find a way to plot revenge against this person who has offended me or done something nasty to me, uh, how I respond. There's all kinds of temptations, but what, at its root, what is temptation really all about? And I think that's where this story of Jesus' own experience of temptation is so helpful to us. I sort of see it as like an MRI scan, a deep scan to get down below the surface to see on the inside not just the inside of Jesus as a person, but the inside of the whole mechanism of what's going on with temptation. And it puts us out, so what in the world is the devil's goal? I mean, we're not tempted just by the devil, but the story since the devil, because ultimately there are dark spiritual forces that want to frustrate uh, God's plans. And a good way of doing that is getting at some of the, the people God created and loves <laughs> And if you can destroy their lives, my gosh, you can make God hurt, right? And, that, and that's sort of what the devil's strategy is. What, what is his real goal in, when he's tempting Jesus? And it comes out crystal clear in the second temptation on the list. The devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you, I will give their glory and, and all this authority where it's been given over to me. I think we know somebody in a certain country that's wanting that right now. But anyway, to you I will give their glory and this authority, for it's been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If, here's, here's the demand, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. It is so clear here. When you get at the bedrock of what temptation is about, whether it's from the devil or from other things in our lives, at the bedrock, the devil wants us to shift our worship from the living God, our creator, the source, to a substitute. Isn't that right? The devil wants us to replace God with somebody else. Worship me, serve me. He wants us to replace our allegiance, our connection to the very source of our life, the source of good, the source of meaning, the source of love, the source of truth. He wants us to replace that living God with a substitute. Did you ever think that temptation was that serious? Did it ever fall 
And what I just said is actually, it's a temptation to idolatry. You have put something else in place of God. Someone else, something else in the place of God. I mean, it's that clear. Temptation is a strategy that the devil uses to try to get us to substitute the creature for the creator. Because you know what? The devil's a creature. The devil is not God. God. The devil is not a creator. The devil likes to tear things down, doesn't know how to build anything up. <laughs> right? The devil's a creature. And this is so ironic in this story, particularly, Jesus is the son of God, and he's asking the cre cre creator to substitute for a creature. The devil is asking Jesus to serve the devil's ego and the devil's purposes. In other words, he says, give in to this. I'll give you all of these kingdoms, this authority, and all that stuff. But in the end, the devil's just using him. The devil's using him. Isn't that what's going on? Temptation is a strategy to get us to substitute our own ego or something else, whatever it may be, or the devil himself, and put it in the place of where God is supposed to be. Because God is the, the very foundational relationship of our very existence. Our purpose, our meaning, life itself is rooted in the living God. And nowhere else. There is no life anywhere else. But the devil wants to convince us through temptation to substitute that as the foundational relationship of our very sense of who we are and the way we live for something else, for creature, instead of creator. I sort of see it like uh, this temptation is sort of, I, I like to watch the spy movies, and espionage movies, and read Jean Le Carré and, and other stuff. I've happened to know a couple of spies in my life, and I just, one of the things about those movies is they, they want to get somebody to do something so they can get a hook in them and use it as blackmail, <laughs> right? Because, man, oh, look at the benefits you'll get from this. Do this for me, and wow, it's, the, the, the way is paid for you. And they do it, and then they got their hooks in, and things turn really quickly. Well, the devil <laughs> is trying to do, he, he wants to black, get Jesus to do one of these things so he can blackmail him and control him. It may not feel like that when we're going through a simple temptation over filing our taxes or whatever it is, the temptations, the real serious ones you wrestle with or I wrestle with. Um, anything to get us away from the living God and centering our lives in our core being in that foundational relationship. You know, when we look at uh, the devil's goal, of course, to get us to worship and serve him, uh, because he wants to, to control us for his own purposes. He doesn't care about our purposes. And that's just an illusion. It just enters in his own purposes. But when we look at Jesus' temptation experience, we also can see what's truly at stake. It's one thing to say, what is the devil's goal? But what in the world is at stake if you go ahead with the temptation? I mean, of course, if it's just a, a, a cupcake, I may gain a pound or two, or I may clog an artery. I mean, that could have some serious implications, but getting down to the brass tacks, since we see that the devil's goal is to get us to substitute uh, the creature for the creator, to elevate our own ego perhaps to the center of what life is all about instead of thinking of our life in connection to the living God. The other is that if Jesus had given in to any of these temptations, God's plan of salvation would have been sabotaged. God's plan of salvation would have been sabotaged if Jesus had said yes to the devil. And think how tragic that would be. Think how that would break God's heart. And God would be kicking himself, so to speak, saying, how in the world did I ever lose my love beloved because of this guy? <laughs> right? If Jesus had given in to the devil's temptation, uh, he would not have been able to fulfill God's purpose, not only for him, but the, but the purpose of humanity and all creation was tied up in this. 
the path of faithfulness, let's put this on the positive side, by, by staying faithful, by resisting this temptation, and staying true to God through all of these temptations, Jesus stayed on a path of faithfulness and truth to God. And by doing that, God, he was able to fulfill God's purpose for him. That's really wonderful. When we give in to temptation, when we do what we know, go, knowingly go against what we know is right, when we elevate our ego over God's ego and over other people, we're act actually taking authority into our own hands and acting as if we are God. Say, no, God, what you said doesn't, it's, it's what I want. It's not what you want that matters here. We're substituting our authority for God's. The Apostle Paul calls this lawlessness, you know, or licentiousness, taking a license and privileges so that they don't really belong to you, right? That's licentiousness. Um, and what happens is, when we do that, is we sabotage our own lives. We sabotage God's purpose for us and the real meaning of our lives. The sense of fulfillment and well-being that God has plans. God has beautiful, wonderful dreams and plans for each of us. But we sabotage that when we give in to the devil's schemes or to the temptations. When we try to substitute creature for creator, when we elevate our ego above all else, even above God. But of course, the devil doesn't want us to know what's at stake. <laughs> the devil doesn't want us to believe, oh no, that's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. No, the devil is more like a, a, a great Hollywood producer, no? and, and we're going to create this dream world, right? Uh, the devil tries to make, make it look like, look, you follow me, and it's like a visit to Disneyland. But in reality, it's like driving on the I-4 in rush hour. <laughs> it's no giving into the devil. It's the I-4 at rush hour. It's not going to Disneyland. But the devil makes you want to think, I'm going to Disneyland. So I go, look at all of the benefits. I mean, I could rule the world. I, can, I don't have to be hungry. I can turn these stones into bread. I can, wow. Wow. We don't realize it when we play these little games of temptation that we're actually sabotaging our best interests. I said in another sermon, the very best outcomes for our lives is the path of faithfulness. The very best outcomes for our lives and all of those connected to us, our family, our children, our co-workers, whatever, our nation, our community, all of that, the best outcomes for any of that is for me to walk a path of faithfulness, for you to walk a path of faithfulness. But the devil had, in this passage too, gives us a, a couple of hooks the, the tools that the devil uses. There's two basic tools we see in this story in the devil's temptation of Jesus. And the first one, of course, are enticements. He does some different kinds of enticements. Uh, there could, we could probably come up with some others, but we know that you're going to be enticed with something, right? One of them is appeal to our needs, very legitimate needs. Man, I need, I need food. Uh, I need relationship. I need to make a living. I need all kinds of things to appeal to our needs to appeal to our desires, of course, that's a very easy thing to appeal to. Mm, boy, that smells so good. I, mm, I love that. Uh, appeal to our desires, uh, but more so sort of appealing to our ego. Oh, wow. If you can appeal to my ego and make me think I'm, I'm, I'm a bigger, better, greater something, especially if I'm better than everybody else, wow. You appeal to my ego, that is so attractive, isn't it? That is enticing. Look at in Jesus, he said, uh, after 40 days of fasting, he starved. He said, well, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Take a loaf of bread. Well, of course, he's hungry. Or the ego desire. He says, I will give you all these kingdoms of the world and the authority and everything. Wow, you'll be the most biggest, best-known celebrity in all the planet. This desire for power and status and celebrity and all of that kind of stuff. Everyone just looks at you and goes, oh, wow, you know. Or he tempts him to test God. Wait a minute. You say you're a Christian. You say you're a, you know, that you're a child of God and all this. Test God. If, if, it's, if you're really a child of God, you're standing on the pinnacle temple, just jump off. The scripture says the, devil, the, the angels will come and keep you from smashing on the rocks below. 
We're tempted to see if God's real and try to do some kind of fakey thing to prove it. So the first tool the devil uses are these different kinds of enticements. The second thing, which is even before this other, but it's based, are lies. <laughs> Twisted truth. You know, the most effective lies are the ones that are 90, 95% true, and there's just a piece of misinformation or, or, or lie. It's like taking, taking something that's lined up well and turning it a couple of degrees another way, and then it doesn't quite fit. If you don't line up those gears, <laughs> you're going to have a problem, right? But uh, the devil uses lies and twists it to try to, with, with a lot of truth in it, but then twitches it because it's a lot harder to argue against a falsehood if it's 95% true than if it's, you know, 100% false. Um, and so what do we do? What do we do? Uh, but on this information, we, we, look, we make excuses. Oh, I'm, I'm fighting in this temptation thing. We make excuses or we rationalize. Oh, we give reasons that we should go ahead and do this uh, sometimes, right? Uh, my dad said this to me in high school, and it stuck. And I'm sure it was the Spirit of God that make it stick. Uh, but one time my dad said, Mark, we can always rationalize our favorite sins. <laughs> we can rationalize. We can come up with reasons, not excuses, reasons to go ahead and do what it is we want to do, even though we may know it's wrong, right? I think the, or perhaps when it comes to our own personal struggle with temptation, one of the most pernicious and effective lies of the devil is he gives us this idea that you can't win. You can't win. You're a sinner. There's no way you can have victory over temptation. I mean, humanity is weakened by sin, so there's no way you can be holy in your conduct, holy in your relationships. You can't be, live as a, as a beautiful child of God completely. You're always corrupted. Something's wrong. So he attempts to fool us into the idea that there's no escape, ultimately, from the devil's clutches. And that's the lie. We can. Jesus isn't the only one who can escape the devil's clutches and the temptations that we face from wherever they come. We can. And Jesus shows us some tools to fight temptation. Uh, we're a bit limited on time this morning. I'm not going to these very much, but I'm going to just mention them because they're right here. The first thing is, how do you combat a lie? With truth. <laughs> of course, the devil and Jesus have a little had a little uh, wordle back and forth with scriptures. They play a word games back and forth, and of course, the devil takes that scripture and then he switches it, just that, does that little couple of degrees off kilter, and Jesus comes back and puts it back on kilter and comes back with truth. Because, uh, but it isn't just about citing scripture when we're fighting temptation. Uh, the, the, the battle of truth is the truth about ourselves, right? What's really going on here? What's really going on here? The truth about God, of course, about truth about us, the truth about our situation, and not making excuses or rationalizations. That is one of the things, if you'll bring absolute honesty and truth to whatever it is you're facing, that is a great, gives a great source of strength to be victorious over the temptation. The second thing is, from, from a deep choice inside, Jesus' total commitment to God. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. We don't play just lip service to that. We can decide at the deep core of our being. In fact, that's what happens when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, isn't it? We make that fundamental decision, but sometimes we need to be renewed in that. And the season of Lent is a time when we rethink this stuff and look it over again and, and, and cooperate with the Spirit of God to bring us back into line so that we make that commitment. No, God, you and you alone. I'm not going to worship my ego. I'm not going to worship any false god. I'm going to worship you and you alone. And that is a, what's called a vacuum cleaner decision. Once you make it, all the other decisions, you don't have to make a decision because it's already decided. I know who I'm going to serve. I know who I'm going to obey. I know what I'm going to do. Third thing to help that Jesus did, and he depended on God and not himself. He trusted and depended on God. Jesus was living as a fully human being, you know, uh, he wasn't cheating. He said, one does not live by bread alone. It isn't just by bread. There's something deeper than our basic human physical needs in this life. Our connection with the living God is the absolute most important 
thing. And he walked, he trust and dependence, and here's another way that the devil likes to get at us. Trust and dependence is not a sign of weakness. Uh, in, our, in our highly individualistic society and the great pride of independence, blow my own brute self kind of talk, uh, sometimes to, to say, I'm trusting God, I've got to depend on someone else, I need somebody else's help, uh, is seen as weakness. But Jesus is showing us, no, 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 no. It's, God is God, <laughs> and we put our trust and depend on God to walk with us in our journey. And, and the devil doesn't want that because the devil wants us to trust on him, obviously. And then lastly, Jesus was confident in his identity and purpose. Because he was totally committed to God, but he was also clear about who he was. Not in some magical way different than you. You and I have to be clear about who we are as God's children, as temples of the Holy Spirit, as citizens of the kingdom of God. Those are very real things. Those are not just a list of words and platitudes. Jesus was clear on his identity and purpose, and he stayed true to his identity and purpose, that was rooted in God. Jesus said that the truth will set us free. That living true to our real identity as God's children by worshiping the one and serving the one and only living God and living out of our dependence on and trust in God, this is our path to victory. This is our path to fulfillment and purpose in our lives. Just as Jesus was true to God's vision and purpose for him, let us be true to God's purpose and vision for us. Let us be confident in our identity as God's children. I close with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10, verse 13. It's a great memory verse. I encourage you to go ahead and memorize it. Uh, I did back in high school. <laughs> it's a wonderful verse. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful, and God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We are never free from temptation. We will always be tempted in this life. But we can be victorious over let us pray. Our gracious God, we worship and serve you. We depend upon and trust you. We choose to believe truth and goodness. We choose to live out of our identity as your children, as temples of your spirit, as citizens of your kingdom. God, we have all of the strength that we need within us to be victorious over temptation and to remain true to you. I just pray that you would help us where those areas where we need to realign and reassess in our commitment, that you would bring us to that point of new commitment and trust in you. In Christ's name, amen.